This lesson discusses groundwater flow basics with a focus on groundwater pollution tracing. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Boat of Knowledge in the Science Classroom program. How much groundwater do you think there is? Make a guess. Now consider this. Of all the water on Earth, only 3% is fresh water. And of that 3%, 20% is groundwater. That means 0.006% of Earth's water is groundwater. Now how much groundwater do you think there is? You might be surprised to find out that there are 2.78 million trillion gallons of water stored underground. Let's put that amount into perspective. That's enough water to fill over 4 trillion Olympic-sized swimming pools, or enough to cover the entire continent of the United States with water at a depth of 4.5 feet. But not all groundwater is accessible. So how much groundwater do we actually use? According to USGS data from 2005, groundwater is a large component of the water used for domestic, irrigation, livestock, and mining purposes. Some states withdraw more groundwater than others, but as of 2005, the majority of states are within the 0 to 2,000 million gallons per day range. Where is all that groundwater stored? We know it's under the ground, but the ground is solid, so where does all the water go to? Groundwater is stored in the soil pore spaces and fractures of rock formations below the water table. The water table forms the boundary between the saturated zone and unsaturated zone. Water in the saturated zone is groundwater. All the spaces are completely filled with water. In the unsaturated zone, the pore spaces are filled with water and air. The water in this zone is not groundwater. It's just water that's held to the rock surfaces by molecular attractions. The soil and rocks where groundwater is stored are called aquifers. Aquifers are water-bearing rocks that transmit water to wells and springs and can supply a usable amount of water. There are two types of aquifers, confined and unconfined. What do you think the difference between these kinds of aquifers might be? As the name suggests, confined aquifers have impermeable upper and lower bounds. On the other hand, unconfined aquifers only have a single impermeable layer which forms the lower bound, and the upper bound is the water table. Because confined aquifers have two bounding layers, they are highly pressurized. Do you think we can pump water from confined aquifers? Confined aquifers are not typically the source of water withdrawals, but artesian wells can occur under high pressure and at an elevation lower than the recharge zone. Since confined aquifers are difficult to access, Unconfined aquifers are the source of water withdrawals. Not only is it relatively easy to drill a well into an unconfined aquifer and begin pumping, but unconfined aquifers also recharge faster. We can see in this diagram that the unconfined aquifer can recharge in days or years, but the confined aquifers can take centuries or even millennia to recharge. However, just because unconfined aquifers have a faster recharge rate doesn't mean that overpumping doesn't occur. For example, let's look at the High Plains Aquifer, which is the largest usable groundwater source in the United States. This aquifer has recharge rates that are slower than the pumping rates, which results in depletion of the aquifer. This diagram illustrates the depletion over a 17-year period. Notice how the aquifer has experienced more declines than rises. In this picture, try to label the unconfined aquifer, confined aquifer, artesian well, flowing artesian well, and pumping well. Continue with the video once you've finished labeling. The top aquifer is the unconfined aquifer, since it has a confining lower bound and the water table for an upper bound. The bottom aquifer is the confined aquifer, since it is bounded on the top and bottom by impermeable layers. The well that terminates in the confined aquifer, but is also below the recharge zone elevation, is the flowing artesian well. 
it follows that the well that terminates in the confined aquifer but is above the recharge zone elevation is the artesian well. And the well that taps into the unconfined aquifer is the pumping well. Looking at this diagram, how do you think groundwater becomes contaminated? What do you think contaminates groundwater? Groundwater pollution comes from three main sources, agricultural practices, residential issues, and industrial wastes. What might be an example of each? Agricultural pollutants include fertilizers and organic wastes. Residential pollutants include oil leaks, antifreeze spills, and leaky septic tanks. Industrial wastes include degreasers, landfill leachates, aged gas chambers, and mine drainage. With so many possible pollution sources, how do we know the pollution source when groundwater becomes contaminated? Knowing the source of pollution is important for remediating the problem, so pollution tracing techniques are applied. Pollution tracing can help pinpoint the origin of groundwater contamination by using pollutant tracers and monitoring wells. It can also help to predict where the pollution might travel to next. There's one key element to pollution tracing. Try to guess what it is while we go through this example. The wells circled in red have been identified as contaminated with hydrocarbons from fuel. What are the possible sources of the pollution? We notice gas stations, a car wash, and multiple gasoline and oil tanks. But how do we narrow all these possibilities down to the few potential sources? The key to solving this problem is to remember that water flows from high to low. Let's look at the elevations of the contaminated wells compared to the sources. The gas station and car wash are above the contaminated wells but they are also above well MW3, which is not contaminated. If these were the sources of pollution, well MW3 should also be contaminated. Therefore, we can eliminate these sources from the list of suspects. That leaves us with four gasoline and oil tanks, two next to the office building, one between the warehouses, and one between the office and warehouse. The two beside the office building are above wells B1 and MW2, but they cannot have contaminated well MW4 because they are at the same elevation. That only leaves two possible sources, the tank between the office and warehouse and the tank between the warehouses. Let's do a quick review before moving on to the activities. Pause the video and take a few minutes to fill in the answers before viewing the solutions. We learned at the beginning of this lecture that groundwater is stored in aquifers. There are two kinds of aquifers, confined and unconfined. The difference between the two is dictated by the bounding layers. If both bounding layers are impermeable, then the aquifer is confined. If the aquifer has one impermeable layer below and a water table above, then it is unconfined. A flowing artesian well occurs when two conditions are satisfied. At high pressure, and an elevation lower than the recharge zone elevation. Unconfined aquifers are used as a water supply source because they are easy to access and recharge faster than confined aquifers. The three major types of groundwater contaminants come from agricultural, residential, or industrial sources. An example of each includes fertilizer, septic systems, and mine drainage. Pollution tracing can be used to find the source of groundwater pollution because we know that water flows from high elevation to low elevation. For a better understanding of groundwater pollution, complete the following activities that are a part of this lesson. In the Tracking Pollution Whodunit, you will apply the pollution tracing technique to determine the pollution source after drawing contours and making a topo map. In the Groundwater Contamination Model activity, you can view what happens once groundwater becomes contaminated using either a ready-to-use model or by building your own model. You can also learn more about this and similar topics by visiting these other related video lessons.